Central C has Cineworld. Jay Huss has The Ugliest. Dave has Psycho. Fredo has PG London. Some of Britain's top rappers are launching their own clothing lines, taking full advantage of their celebrity status, their fashion influence, and the demand for urban apparel within the UK's thriving streetwear scene. Our homegrown streetwear brands have benefited greatly as the global influence of our top rappers has reached an all-time high. The recent boom within UK street fashion has been taking place at a time where British urban artists are expected attendees and participants at runway shows and fashion award ceremonies. By the looks of things, there's never been a better time for a British rapper to launch a fashion brand. And it's safe to say we'll be seeing more of these rapper-owned clothing lines popping up in the future. While these clothing lines all get a natural boost from the celebrity profile of their famous founders, an inevitable challenge for each of them will be establishing the brand's credibility outside of its owner. Without doing this, the brand will have to heavily rely on the relevance of its founder and ultimately risk being treated as, dare I say it, much. much. Although merch can be fashionable, by definition, it's a product created specifically for the purpose of promoting something or someone. Merch tends to directly rely on the popularity of the celebrity it's connected to as the main catalyst driving consumers to purchase. A fashion brand, on the other hand, will usually prioritize factors such as style, symbolism, and effective branding. It's not uncommon for us to see the lines between merch and fashion get blurred, particularly within street culture. Santan Dave's Psycho Streetwear literally started out as merchandise for his debut album, Psychodrama, which was released in early 2019. But he continued to drop Psycho t-shirts even after his album campaign was over, transforming the merch into a genuine clothing line. In the music video to his hit single, Starlight, Dave rocks Cortez clothing and casually aligns himself with the brand's founder, Klim419. Dave's friends are wearing the Bane Psycho tee which features a large imprint of a muzzled dog on the back. This was probably the most highly demanded psycho design to date, which makes sense considering the amount of exposure it got. Starlight stayed at the top of the charts for four weeks straight, setting the record for a UK solo rap single. Not to mention, Clint's cameo in the video marked a significant moment for Cortez and UK streetwear as a whole. Psycho was a part of that moment. Dave wore Clint's brand and stood in allegiance with him while simultaneously introducing his own brand to the conversation of upcoming UK streetwear brands. Later that year, Dave linked up with Brazilian football legend Adriano. The two were spotted playing football together, along with the full team all sporting green psycho tees emblazoned with an illustration of Adriano on the back. Around this time, a promotional video confirming the collaboration was posted on the Long Live Psycho Instagram account. Das favelas cariocas para as torres londrinas que flertam com as nuvens. Uma profecia? Uma promessa? Uma marca? As you can imagine, the tees quickly sold out. Dave also dropped a song titled Adriano exclusively on Psycho's password protected website, once again using his star power to draw the attention of his supporters to the Psycho brand. As you can see, Dave's approach has somewhat blurred the lines between merch and the legit streetwear label. Here in the UK, our rappers and MCs have a history of blurring the lines between merch and fashion. However, we haven't yet seen a British urban artist establish a fashion brand that can stand on its own and thrive. If you can name any, feel free to educate me in the comments. American brands like Jordan and Yeezy have greatly benefited from the celebrity of their owners, but are not solely dependent on their popularity. Over time, both brands have become bona fide fashion labels cemented in urban culture. We don't need to see MJ or Ye rocking their brand in order for us to copy it. Celebrity influence can only take a brand so far. If a brand being associated with an icon was all it took for it to have long-term success, Lil Wayne's truck fit wouldn't have been so short-lived. 
and more recently, Beyonce's Ivy Park brand wouldn't have flopped. Evidently, a successful fashion brand can't thrive off of star power alone. We're going to take a look at the connections between merch and street fashion within the British urban music scene. To get a fuller understanding of the relationship, we need to go back to the era of grime and graphic tees. But first, let's take a look at where grime music came from. Grime music was influenced by multiple cultures and genres. However, to a great degree, it evolved from the UK garage sound as a grittier, street-focused alternative. Whereas UK garage has always been a dance genre, with artists making feel-good music for clubs and raves. Unlike grime, the general aesthetic of UK garage had a dress-to-impress element, whether the dress code was smart or casual. I was born in the mid 90s, so I didn't get to fully indulge in this era, as the prime days of UK Garage was the mid to late 90s. But I still remember all the family members and their friends getting ready for raves. The guys would generally rock a smart shirt with jeans, some clocks on their feet, and the ladies usually wore a sexy dress or some stylish outfit along those lines. Italian fashion brands like Moschino, Iceberg, and Armani were top tier. The influence of American hip hop fashion was also ever present with heavy leather jackets by brands like Avrex and Pele Pele becoming highly coveted pieces, and new era hats becoming the headwear of choice for the manda, despite the fact that we're not really into baseball over here. <laughs> what you laughing at? In 2001, So Solid Crew dominated the UK garage sound. So Solid had multiple top 10 singles. Their hit single 21 Seconds topped the charts at number one, and their debut album, They Don't Know, peaked at number 6. And even then, those numbers do no justice considering the irreversible impact they had on British urban music. Not only did they dominate the UK garage sound, they also completely shifted it. The spirit of street culture was evident as elements of road rap were incorporated, and although it was still undeniably dance music, the instrumentals had a darker, more menacing feel to them. Talking about you in the place, me. I am prepared for you. Check with me or check one of my chicks when they're not with me or talk about my shit when I go on a tour or pick my click, you're a target scoreboard. Wait, this new combination of street lyrics and darker beats, along with the visual of 20 to 30 members, laid the groundwork for what would later emerge as grime music. What Mega Man did was so solid musically, influenced all UK street music genres immeasurably thereafter. Though Solid's whole aesthetic perfectly captured the stylish dress code of UK Garage, like the classy blazers and button-ups, as well as the more casual look of that era. Averitt's jackets were standard. On multiple occasions, the group rocks custom clothing with their crew's name on it, oftentimes printed all over. Unfortunately, their iconic drip was never officially for sale. The items were more sophisticated than a simple tee with So Solid printed on the front, so mass production wouldn't have been an overnight venture. Not to mention, one didn't just start a fashion label on a whim back then. The logistics were completely different before the rise of e-commerce and the internet as a whole. So Solid would later go on to sell merch, but not at a significant level as far as I'm aware. Whatever the case, the crew were ahead of their time with the self-branded clothing. Wearing your own garments would later become a crucial element in the grime movement. I wear my own garments, man see me on road on one arm. I wear my own garments, man see me on road on one arm. I wear my own garments, man see me on road on one arm. In the early days when grime was just being established as a genre, street fashion elements that we saw in the garage scene crossed over, such as the American leather jackets and fitted caps. You can see them in early day grime tunes like What You Call It by Wiley or Oi by Morfire Crew. The dance component from Garage was still present early on. However, though the dance component never completely went away, over time a more masculine, street-oriented sound developed as young hungry MCs and producers fought to be heard and respected. I'm not gonna lie, I'm getting mad right now. What's he talking about? Like bang, banging and solving up. What are you talking about? Oh, what, no, talking no, up no. to other no, fucking no, bad no, boys, no, yo. No, no. Fucking bad boy, you fucking pussy. <laughs> do your research. Mind, hey, where's no. Carlos? Where's Carlos? Answer my man was in jail, but. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. 
Grime music had a much greater focus on the harsh realities that came with growing up on London's poorer estates, so there was much less pressure to dress up. Sportswear became the new standard, especially as we got used to seeing artists in their natural habitat by way of DVD and later on YouTube. This shift in fashion sense towards simple and comfortable casual wear set the stage for entrepreneurial grime MCs. They would produce inexpensive t-shirts with their own brand on it, wear them for promotion, and sell them to loyal fans at a profit. As far as this business model goes, no one from the grime scene executed it better than Boy Better Know. Boy Better Know. I wear my own gums. The iconic Grime Collective was formed in 2005 and Boy Better Know Tees hit the market shortly after. JME and Skepta were front and center when it came to the promotion of the tees. Not only were the brothers constantly rocking the shirts, they incorporated the merch into several of their lyrics. Don't forget that I'm Skepta, take a photo, black t-shirt, boy better no logo. Man Buy another t-shirt then, cuz, why do you think they're all hollering at me? The Boy Better Know brand quickly grew in popularity within the underground scene, leading to the popularization of the phrase, Boy Better Know. The phrase was both a solemn warning and a statement of confidence. Ultimately, it came to not only represent the grime crew, but also a prevalent inner city mindset. As the brand grew bigger than the group, demand increased rapidly, and before you knew it, bootleggers started popping up in markets and online with counterfeit Boy Better Know tees, along with designs that played on the brand such as Girl Better Know, Girl Better Blow, etc. JME, the self-proclaimed Boy Better Know CEO, was understandably not amused by any of it. You can get fake tees off eBay, let me explain. Girl Better Blow, Girl Better Show, Girl Better Know. They're all fake, Boy Better Know. If you got them t-shirts right there, you're on your own. <laughs> Make me laugh. If you want a t-shirt, bruv, just ask. If I see any more Boy Better Gums, I'll put on my V4 vendor to mask and come to your shop and start wrapping up fast. Girl Better Blow ain't in my class. What, you think I make t-shirts for these little stupid raggedos with no... What are you wearing that t-shirt for? Trap, you can get free for a score at Wembley Market, you can get four. Some people in Girl Better Blow t-shirts want a picture, but I'm too raw. Sorry, no, your t-shirts... Whatever the case, Boy Better Know set the bar as far as grime merch goes and also blurred the lines between merch and street fashion. Thousands of BBKTs, both authentic and counterfeit, were sold over the years. And almost two decades later, we can still catch JME displaying the legendary logo across his chest. By the late noughties, several Grime MCs had their own t-shirts for sale. East London Grime artist Tinchy Strider dropped his first Star in the Hood mixtape in 2007 and also started pushing Star in the Hood tops around that time. His 2008 song, Strider Man, was virtually an advertising campaign for the tees. And as he climbed the ladder of commercial success, achieving multiple top 10s and number 1s, he could be seen rocking his brand in the majority of his music videos. Loyal fans were able to buy the tees from his website. Similar to Boy Better Know, Star in the Hood is a phrase that is functional beyond its direct connection to a popular artist. People were able to identify with it whether or not they were big fans of Tenchi, causing the lines between merch and fashion to be blurred once again. Some rocked it as Tenchi Strider merch, while others wore it more as a street fashion. JD Sports saw the viability of the t-shirts and did a deal with Tenchi in 2010, resulting in the popular tees being stocked in JD stores all over the country. That was a big deal back then, the first of its kind. This is before retailers like JD Sports and Foot Asylum were checking for the Mandem streetwear. That's a direct testament to Star in the Hood's workability as a legit fashion label. In the late noughties, we also saw Retch Free 2 launch his Retro Boys merch line and his fellow movement crew member Scorcher launched his Skywalker merch. The merch sold well to fans, but didn't have the same level of impact as Star in the Hood or Boy Better Notice. It's a shame the movement didn't get together to launch merch collectively. The group was a force to be reckoned with in grime, and the name had great branding potential. Retro Boys literally had Wretch's name in it, and Skywalker is another name Scorcher goes by. In that regard, the tees were definitely merch. Nonetheless, the brand names were ambiguous enough to pass as fashion brands, and that was the aim. 
Unfortunately, in the late noughties and early 2010s, grime was losing its edge. The music industry shifted away from anything resembling street music. Around this time, many of grime's leading MCs started experimenting with their sound, softening their image and watering down their lyrics. Grime went through an identity crisis, as a whole bunch of council estate raised MCs were now making commercialized dance music and pop songs. While grime artists were fighting for commercial success, road rap was on the rise, and no one dominated the UK rap scene of the late noughties like Giggs and Spare No One did. Giggs was rapping since the early 2000s, but his name really started to ring bells around 2007. And by 2008, Giggs was heavily pushing SN one way, along with fellow members and affiliates of the group. Swagger's in tap now yeah. Video I had the bullies in the background yeah. AJ jeans talking the hardest top And we got the hoodies and the hats now <laughs> The boogers looking blacked out Ow. With the SM1 nigger on the back Ouch. 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 Spend with the SM1 chain Bling. I just had to give a fat shout <laughs> Talking the hardest, that's the track now To be honest, the pieces weren't particularly fashionable Minimal designing went into most of the tees, with many of them simply displaying gigs phrases in the most basic font. If it wasn't that, then it was probably the scratchy SN1 logo with the wings. Gigs later admitted that his dedication to rocking the merch messed up his swag for a while. Notice your swag level's gone up a couple of notches. Tim. No, I just noticed, I just noticed, and I ain't looking, I just noticed. You know what it is, but you see, let me break it, you see, when I was in the... My old job. Mm. I was always stepping out, you know what I'm saying? Oh, you was always stepping yeah. out and taking that away, man. Then I, start, then I started taking the rap seriously, and then it was just tracksuits every minute. Like, you know, mm. that one's like t shirts, mm. SA one wear. Mm. It's fucking oh, you were heavy, you were heavy on this one. I can't, like, you yeah, know, man. You know, you got to support heavy, the team. You were heavy, you were heavy, you were heavy. Oh, you were heavy, yes, and one. I remember that, man. And I was thinking, right. From the chain to the t shirt to the sweatshirt. Yeah, to the t shirt, you know, no one's Oh, like, my days. Although SN1 merch didn't do the best job in becoming a fashion brand, it is irrefutably embedded in UK rap history. A moment to remember is when Gigs linked up with Skepta for their song, Look Out, in 2009. SM1 on no my tea again My flat trousers D&G again yes. yes Both rappers made mention of their merch in the song And rocked their brands side by side in the video Skeng in South, I heard it in North Yes, they hate we got boy better no T-shirts And SM1 wear for the whole world to endorse Of course, North's up in this bitch I don't know what Giggs wasn't the only rapper to juxtapose his merch with BBKs In 2010, Rept and Conan made a name for themselves When their mixtape Tsunami took the underground rap scene by storm the duo were rapping well before 2010 as a part of a clique called Gypset, but once they started taking music seriously, they created the Play Dirty brand. By 2011, they had Play Dirty Tees, initially just to sell on tour, but they later made it available online and produced a wider selection of items. The Screwface graphic made their clothing easy to identify and separated their merch from everyone else's. You already know that I'm eager. I had to stop wearing night cause I feel her. Then I told her the screw face design coupled with the I play dirty catchphrase made for a good streetwear line and didn't limit the customer base to only diehard fans. And later that year, the pair linked up with JME for a tune called Boy Better Play Dirty. Boy better know I play dirty. Boy better know I play dirty. As you'd imagine, the song promoted I Play Dirty Apparel alongside Boy Better Know's well-established brand. Boy Better Know always showed love to other artists in the scene selling their own clothing. Even when Lethal Bizzle launched his Stay Dench clothing line, JME and Frisco jumped on the Leave It remix and took part in the music video, which promoted Lethal's brand all throughout. Around that time, Skepta also sent light jabs in the spirit of friendly competition. No t-shirts, that's my thing. I got a black one of these, white writing. I got a white one of these with red writing. It's at my house, but you can have this one if you come back to the hotel. Lethal said he's got tees as well. I told him shut him up, they won't sell. You can't school me about t-shirt bees. Or JME, what go on for the summer collection, boy? The word dench is a word Lethal made up and popularized on the net around 2010. As the phrase grew in popularity, his fans started to request for dench tees to be made. In 2011, Lethal made some pretty basic tees, initially selling them on the Grime Daily website. Don't know, everyone's been talking about the t-shirts. 
man's got them in it. Like man's got girls ones. Man's got obviously boys ones. We're gonna be doing kids ones. We're gonna go into hoodies. We're gonna be doing jumpers. Dench all dench. Leave it. Yeah. The merch sold well, and Lethal quickly found himself developing the brand to become a legitimate fashion line with aspirations of attracting customers beyond his fan base. Within less than two years, Lethal managed to go from printing basic tees to offering a wide selection of clothing, partnering with major brands and selling in major high street retailers. Is it true it was in the Arsenal shop? Or is that yeah, a really yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was, we done, that, was our, that was my first deal. We done a That's deal crazy. at Arsenal uh, back in, what were we, in 2013? At the beginning of 2012, we done a deal with them. So, you know, now we've got the, we're doing collaborations with Starter now and stuff. Huge, you huge know, Starter. So, um, so yeah, and like, you know, we're in Selfridges now. We're in Foot Asylum. Right, Selfridges, huge. Yeah. And, uh, His vision of evolving the brand from merch to a verified fashion label came to fruition. As you can see, British urban artists have a history of blurring the lines between merch and fashion. So it shouldn't be surprising that UK rappers are outright launching fashion brands now, while using the same marketing model our rappers have been using from day one to sell merch. Basically taking advantage of their popularity and influence as musicians to sell clothes. Central C's clothing brand Cineworld is sold by this method. The overarching premise of the brand is that Central C wears it and owns it, and therefore it's cool. It's technically not much, but at this early stage, it might as well be. I imagine that will change over time though. Kinda like how Drake pushed OVO clothing in the beginning, then gradually distanced himself from the brand so it could develop credibility beyond his direct influence. It's currently a great time for Central C and other UK rappers to launch streetwear brands. British street fashion is thriving now more than ever before, and the relationship between the urban music scene and homegrown fashion brands has never been stronger. Nowadays, a lot of artists team up with popular streetwear brands when it's time to promote a project. Support from the urban music scene has always been a crucial indicator of a streetwear brand's validity and cultural alignment. Let's take a look at Trapstar London for instance. The brand hit the streets around 2006-2007 and their biggest advocate in the early days was Blade Brown. Blade's trap credibility, combined with his widespread popularity and the new visibility he got from YouTube, helped to expose Trapstar to a much wider audience than just their MySpace friends. The brand went on to become one of the most dominant forces in British street fashion. Ben Jar is another dominant UK streetwear brand. It was launched back in 2007 and embraced by the urban music scene quite early on. More than 15 years later, the brand has very well established ties to the culture and is more relevant than ever. Before we do this, yeah, honourable shout out to Ben Jar. They are the brothers who have powered this. Yeah, so honourable shout out to them. I know that this guy has worked a little bit with them. As Unfortunately, well. this wasn't the outcome for most of the Mandem streetwear brands that were started in the late noughties and early 2010s for a number of reasons. During that era, e-commerce was nowhere near as popular as it is now. So although certain brands got exposure online, Online sales were limited and logistically challenging to execute on a large scale. Also, when new streetwear brands arrived on the scene, they were generally run by young entrepreneurs with a lack of experience in the fashion business and little to no professional support. Major retailers weren't very interested in what the streets had to offer, and investors weren't necessarily jumping at opportunities to do business with these up-and-coming brands or looking to help them to scale up. It was an uphill battle, and these factors, amongst others, led to many not seeing a very promising future for UK streetwear brands. JD Sports had a stronghold on street fashion back then, as they were widely accessible with a selection of well-established labels. So how did we get to the point we're at now, where UK street fashion is thriving? Well, a significant shift in British street culture took place during the mid-2010s, led by the music scene. Between 2014 and 2018, an urban music renaissance took place. The UK drill music sound was developed, giving Britain's inner city streets a new rush of energy. Grime music had a resurgence, with Skepta taking the sound global and Chip going bar for bar with anyone brave enough to respond. Barriers came down as artists from outside of London, like Manchester's Bugsy Malone and Birmingham's Mist, received levels of national attention that has always been notoriously challenging for non-Londoners to achieve and a wave of hungry young rappers washed over the scene, hitting freestyle platforms like checkpoints in a race to stardom. Drill, grime, rap, 
afro swing, everything was going off and UK street culture started to gain traction in the mainstream at an unprecedented level. With the rise of British urban music came the rise of British urban fashion. The bond that has always existed between the music scene and the streetwear brands was strengthened and highlighted for all to see, ultimately inspiring the creation of new streetwear brands as well as attracting commercial attention. In 2016, JD Sports linked up with Bugsy Malone to launch his clothing brand, B Malone. Initially, B Malone started out as a merch collaboration with Supply and Demand, which is a brand owned by JD. But by the following year, B Malone was dropping collections in JD Sports under its own name and establishing itself as a high-end streetwear brand. They even went on to produce several different trainers. This is another instance of merch becoming fashion. As we approached the 2020s, the writing was on the wall in regards to the level of influence street fashion brands from the ends would have moving forward. When Jay Huss announced in 2020 that he was debuting a collection under his brand The Ugliest, it attracted a lot of positive attention, as well as debate over the prices. The puffer jackets were priced at £800, a price that indicates the brand is luxury apparel and not to be confused as any sort of merch. The details, from the designs to the quality of the selected materials, reinforced the high-end element. This drop highlighted a shift in attitudes towards street fashion. Jay Huss doesn't have a background in fashion design, nor the credentials to prove he could run a fashion company. And there wasn't really a demand for his clothing as he grew in popularity, despite the fact he'd been wearing the brand since 2015. Yet when he announced the debut release in 2020, the idea of his luxury streetwear line was generally embraced. His musical talent and success definitely played a role, but a greater influence with the conditions within the streetwear scene around that time. The following year, we saw Ben Jart sign a deal with Harvey Nichols after years of pop-up collaborations. Fully Paid, a brand that was only four years old at the time, signed a deal with Foot Asylum. And Cortez, only three years old, was already designing a sneaker with Nike. These are just a few examples to highlight the current climate of the UK streetwear scene. The culture is thriving, consumer demand is at an all-time high, and large corporations are tapped in. These are the conditions today's artists are benefiting from when they push their own streetwear lines. I've always loved that artists from the ends could capitalize on their popularity by selling clothes with their personal brand on it. I grew up seeing American hip-hop artists and moguls with legit fashion brands like Rockaware, Fat Farm, G-Unit Clothing, Sean John, and the list goes on. These hip-hop brands were globally demanded and the companies behind them had all of the necessary components for running a full-fledged fashion business, including design teams, mass production abilities, and the means for high-volume distribution. Though these brands were linked to hip-hop artists and figures, most of them outgrew the limitations of being regarded as merch. Most of these hip-hop brands came and went, so they're not the best examples as far as standing the test of time goes. However, the level of impact they had by way of cultural significance and global reach is something we haven't seen any British urban artists recreate with their own brand yet. Also, the mistakes and shortfalls that led to so many popular American hip-hop fashion labels going bust is what prepared successful brands like Yeezy to win. So with Rockwear, with Fat Farm, with FUBU, what would happen is we would get a deal with an infrastructure that could facilitate volume. When they should have been renting our brands, that's called the license, they would say, we'll give you this volume, but you got to give up half of your company. So for, Rock, for Rockware, it's me and Jay, and then it's two Russians, 50-50, which equals 25 to me. They should not have liked, they should not have owned that. They should have been able to rent it. We should have owned it. It happened to all of us. All of us are a victim to that. Puff, Russell, me, Fubu, Rachel. But it's a different day now because I know the business and now I can teach y'all the business. While Jay and Dame literally gave away half of Rockaware in order to handle high volume, Ye simply licensed his Yeezy brand to companies that would handle production and distribution while never giving up any ownership of his intellectual property. Shortly after, Drake formed his Nocta brand and did a similar deal with Nike. 
despite Nike refusing to do such a deal with Ye in the past. This is how progress generally happens, in gradual steps, with a series of precedents being set and mistakes being learned from. Here in the UK, we have a very different track record. What's the creative process behind it? If you think putting your logo on a blank is fashion, that's not fashion. Our urban music scene only amassed global appeal very recently. Our streetwear brands are just getting on the map for the most part. And the majority of our millionaires within the culture reached that level within the past five years, 10 at best. As millions of pounds flow into the culture, so does knowledge and opportunity. But I still think it's too early to place high expectations on our rappers with fashion brands. We still have a lot of building to do within the culture in my opinion. And that takes time. Until we reach a certain point, most of these brands owned by rappers will be regarded as Dare I say it? <laughs> much, 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 much. If you've made it this far and haven't liked the video yet, slap that like button for me. And let me know in the comments where you see these rapper fashion brands going in the future. If I had to guess which rapper owned fashion brand would be the most successful 10 years from now, I would guess Skepta's brand, Mains London. Skepta's fashion resume is unmatched as far as British rappers go. And he currently has a major role at Puma through his Big Smoke creative agency, which gives him access to all sorts of valuable information and potential business partners. He's already leveraged his relationship with Puma to get them to support Mains. Skepta has always been interested in fashion, and for the past several years he's really committed himself to it, so it wouldn't be a shock for me to see him outdo the rest of our rappers who own clothing brands. On the other hand, fashion isn't his only focus, so we'll have to see just how much he pours into Mains. But that's my best bet. I'm just like a hustler, isn't it? Like I come from places where I'm just trying to sell. So I've always treated like fashion like merch. And I've learned from like Ella, Mikey, Johnson that it's not merch. I think Central C is currently increasing his value in fashion and proving his selling potential with Sinner. In the long run, I see him leveraging his position to do a significant partnership with a major sportswear brand. Most likely Nike. He's aligned himself with the brand for years and I'd be very surprised if they haven't already approached him for some sort of deal. Sencha's price is steadily going up, so his leverage is increasing. A long-term partnership between his own brand and Nike would be sick. If that were to happen, I'd imagine that brand wouldn't be Cineworld though. My last prediction is that Dave won't keep his psycho brand going for too long. Dave is a drippy guy and luxury fashion is more on brand for him than graphic tees and bodysuits. The word psycho doesn't really correlate with his personal brand either. Psycho streetwear is a calm warm-up for him, but he can definitely get more out of a brand that better aligns with his image and his sound. Obviously, this is all just my opinion. Let me know yours in the comments, and don't forget to give some figures a follow on Instagram and TikTok. Till next time, it's your boy Jasper Mitchell, filling in the blanks.